Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi taala wabarakatuh and salam sejahtera. It is with great pleasure I welcome all the speakers, participants and guests to the Innovative Research and Industrial Dialogue or IRID 2020. The Advanced Manufacturing Center or, or AMC has been organizing the biennial IRID event since 2016 in association with the Faculty of Manufacturing Engineering. This year, with a proven track record in promoting research publication and income generation, Center of Smart System and Innovative Design, also known as COSIT, is given the opportunity to organize IREAD 2020 in collaboration with the Faculty of Manufacturing Engineering and Advanced Manufacturing Center. This research dialogue is a testimony of a successful collaborative effort and commitment between two research groups, the academia and industrial partners that share similar aspirations and interests in research activities. The effort in organizing IREAD 2020 is nothing less than an embodiment towards achieving our noble aim. Ladies and gentlemen, Retaining the same theme of bridging university and industries through research, it is nothing short but to emphasize the symbiotic relationship between the university and industry players in Malaysia towards the betterment of humankind, as well as to enhance innovation through knowledge exchange. Such partnerships not only effectuate groundbreaking research and innovation, but also provide solutions to complex problems and drives economic growth. Ladies and gentlemen, due to the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic, for the first time, IREAD 2020 is organized virtually. This event is a perfect platform for researchers, engineers and postgraduate students, especially in the field of engineering and technology, to present their research findings, to establish mutual knowledge transfers and to extend strategic networking. IREAD 2020 has also been designed to encourage active participation from the industries and act as a platform for open dialogues between university industry practitioners to share and discuss ideas, findings and research discoveries in various areas of engineering especially in the manufacturing engineering which is in line with UTEM's niche areas. Ladies and gentlemen, this year's Industrial Forum's theme, Advancing Future Manufacturing Through University Industry Smart Partnership, aims at accentuating the collaborative relationship in the manufacturing area towards the development of the country. I do hope that the output of this forum will accord positive and productive impacts to all parties besides gearing us to advance in our innovation ventures. I have been informed that IREAD 2020 has received overwhelming responses with more than 100 submissions from diverse engineering fields. After a thorough peer review process, 89 papers have been accepted for publication. Out of this, Six are industrial-based papers which resulted from research collaborations between academia and industry partners. Ladies and gentlemen, through this research-intensive event, I truly hope that new ideas within the realm of the manufacturing engineering ecosystem will materialize. I encourage you to have open and constructive dialogues. I would like to emphasize that we need to think and act fast in this rapidly evolving manufacturing industry. There is no room for complacency. We have to keep abreast with the latest development or we will fall behind. Ladies and gentlemen, with the enthusiasm and support from all the presenters, participants and the commendable effort of the organizing committee, I am fully confident that IREAD 2020 will culminate into another fruitful endeavor. I take this opportunity to wish all participants a successful presentation, 
discussion and a pleasant meeting of minds. May this event be an insightful and highly informative experience for all. And we hope to see you again in future conferences organized by University Technical Malaysia Melaka. On that note, and with the lafaz, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim, I hereby declare the Innovative Research and Industrial Dialogue, IRIT 2020, officially open. Thank you. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi ta'ala wabarakatuh. A noble guest and participant, welcome to Industrial Research Sharing Session of Innovative Research and Industrial Dialogue 2020, IRATE 20, the annual university industry dialogue hosted by the Center of Smart System and Innovative Design COSIT and Faculty of Manufacturing Engineering FKP, University Technical Malaysia, Malacca. Hi, I am Dr. Jeffrey. I'll be your MC of this event today. Ladies and gentlemen, I am honored to inform that we have distinguished guests together with us. Professor Dr. Zamri Benjamaluddin, Dean Faculty of Manufacturing Engineering UTAM, Professor IR Dr. Hambali Ben Arif, Manager Center of Smart System and Innovative Design COSIT UTAM, Mr. Amizi Ben Noor, Operation Director, IdeaSpark Robotics Sendirian Berhad, IR Dr. Abdul Azim Abdul Rahman, Product Engineering Manager, Steelcase Office Solution, Malaysia Sendirian Berhad, and Mr. Abdul Karim bin Muhammad Nasir, Director, Senan Utama Sendirian Berhad. 
Ladies and gentlemen, due to limiting social gathering policy imposed by the Malaysian government, this year version of IRIT 2020 is now conducted through a virtual platform via Webex. Health and safety of our fellow participants, invited guests, industrial experts and committee members are indeed our top priority. The third edition of IRIT 2020 will focus all aspects related to our prime event team, bridging university and industry through research. Ladies and gentlemen, this virtual event is proudly brought to you by the Center of Smart System and Innovative Design COSIT in collaboration with Faculty of Manufacturing Engineering, FKP and Advanced Manufacturing Center, AMC UTEM. Ladies and gentlemen, our important agenda of IRIT 2020 University Industry Research Sharing Session has come to the turn. We are now about to begin for each 15-minute industrial research sharing session featuring three invited speakers. Before we proceed, here are some messages to both industrial speakers and participants to ensure the smoothness of this virtual event. For invited speaker, during the industrial research sharing session, speaker will be spotlighted. Hence, please get the web camera on throughout the session. Please ensure to select the speaker view available at the Webex setting. Question and answer session will be conducted right after the completion of third industrial speaker. For participants, ladies and gentlemen, you may start having questions starting from the first speaker by dropping the question at the Q&A chat box available at YouTube and Facebook, uh, Facebook Live for the reference to the moderator. We will assist on behalf. Ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, let us proceed with our first industrial speaker, Mr. Amizi Ben Noor, Operation Director from the IdeaSpark Robotics mm. Nyan Bahad. Before we proceed further, let me introduce Mr. Amizi Ben Noor, our eminent expertise in robotics and industrial automation. Mr. Amizi Ben Noor is an Operation Director for IdeaSpark Robotics in Rian Bahad, a company that specializes in providing solutions for robotics, industrial automation, and special purpose machine application. Mr. Amizi was graduated from Bachelor of Science in Mechanical Engineering from the Georgia, from, the, from George Washington University, United States of America, in 1991 then pursue his Master's of Science in Manufacturing System Engineering at University Putra Malaysia UPM in 2008. After graduation, Mr. Amizi worked at Proton since 1992 as executive until gradually promoted to head of department of assembly line for Proton Waja in 2000. Later after that, Mr. Amizi was joined IKEA Handel Sindran Berhad as deputy manager from 2005 to 2006, focusing on customer matters for all IKEA stores in Asia Pacific. His new venture with the Autokin Sindrian Berhad has finally led him to his final position as general manager of R&D from 2014 till July 2020. Currently, he is the operation director with important tasks focusing on operation activities. Mr. Amizi also has actively participated as an academic advisor from industry for various higher learning institutions. Ladies and gentlemen, such a great honor for having him today together with us. Please welcome Mr. Amizi Benor. The virtual platform is all yours. Thank you. Can you see my uh, uh, slide? Yes, we can see it clearly, Mr. Amizi. You may okay. proceed. Okay. okay. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Dr. Jeffrey, uh, my fellow invited speakers, professors, lecturers, students, and uh, everybody is watching uh, this session. Uh, sorry. Okay. As mentioned earlier, my name is Amizi Beno, currently working at IDSPAC Robotics, Senwahat. 
the title of my presentation today is Driving Innovation from Hardware to Software Environment. Uh, in this session, I'm going to share uh, the story of how one of the uh, company involved in uh, metal stamping eventually come up with the idea to innovate and then come up with another company uh, focusing on technology and innovation. Okay, so this is the history of my uh, how, do, how it goes. Uh, as mentioned earlier, I, I worked in uh, Auto King. I started here in uh, 2006 after about 14 years experience working in manufacturing, mostly in the Proton. So in Autokin, we had uh, processes of uh, metal stamping, the big machines of uh, 1,200 tons, 800 tons. Then uh, it goes to assembly processes, mostly by robots. Then uh, these are the most components that we send to our uh, uh, customers. So the main customers are Rodua, Proton, Honda, and uh, currently we uh, managed to penetrate a business to uh, Toyota. So mostly we, we produce uh, components like a pillar, uh, reinforcement uh, roof, mainly related to pillars. So these are the components that we produce. Then, uh, of course, we are uh, strongly engaged or embrace manufacturing philosophies promoted by the main uh, customers like Proton and uh, Porodua. So we are very uh, involved in the manufacturing processes uh, to reduce waste, Kaizen activities for continuous uh, improvement, to improve cycle times, uh, TQM, quality exhaust, and VAVE, and other kinds of activities related to lean manufacturing. <clears throat> but at one time, we feel that these are not enough. We feel that we need to go another level. Still, because we have uh, serious issues of uh, foreign workers, most of the workers Maybe sixty percent of them are from Bangladesh, from India, <clears throat> and also we are still facing the uh, issues of inventory in the factory, because if we uh, engage too much of the lean, we have a lot of improvements. So we try to reduce uh, the bulk supply to the production line. So because of that, we have a lot of uh, activity to transfer a small size uh, components to the production, and yet we end up with have another a lot of uh, trolleys to manage. So this is why I call the inventory management problem. And also because of the high operators, say, operators because then we need to have a lot of more people to handle the, handle the processes. Then due to that also we have a uh, uh, lift inside the factory, uh, uh, which uh, lead to issue of safety. And also at one time we can see the market share of the automotive industry is getting smaller and smaller. Then what, what do we need to know? Then we, we, we decide that we need to embrace the, the new technology. Okay, but how? This is a big issue. How? Because we, we invited one of the consultants at one time and they wanted to charge for almost 500,000. It's very expensive for us. And if you want to do it, we uh, want to do it by, myself, by ourselves, the resources, how about the cost? And these are the uh, important criteria that, that we are taking into consideration at time. But we still believe that going to another technology is something like a vital and very important for the future survival. Then finally, this is what we decided. Then we decided to develop a subsidiary company focusing, focusing on the automated guided vehicle development. Then in 2013, the directors allocated certain amount of budget for this uh, activity and we established the company called I just spark robotics in Ambahat. There are a lot of stories, uh, interesting, interesting stories behind uh, the this name, uh, how we come up with this uh, name. Uh, then we employed several uh, fresh talented uh, engineers uh, to, to, to continue this uh, activity. Then we allocated, uh, Autokin allocated some facilities like space, machines, technicians to, to facilitate. And also for the first two years, we decided that to focus more on the R&D only, no sales, whatever. So you can imagine how much uh, money the director uh, invested for this uh, company or activities. Okay, what is an AGV? Uh, of course, I hope everybody, um, most of you understand what it is, but 
for those who are not familiar. So uh, it is a call also it's a call a mobile robot, battery operated, pre programmed to to uh to transfer goods in the factories, hospital, warehouse, and also involved in high repetitive processes in 3D, which are dirty, dangerous, and difficult jobs. And major components are chassis, sensors, and various mechanical, mechanical attachments. So this, these are among the uh, AGV available in the website, as you can see. So I put very on one, more on the examples. So they are available in various sizes, in various uh, uh, capacities and capabilities. Uh, Mr. Chairman, please uh, let me know if you, uh, we are approaching the time. Huh? Okay, why AGV? Because uh, this AGV will help us to reduce the in-house uh, problem, which is more on material handling issues. And also, we foresee that there is a bright future to market this product and available talent. Also, because during our interview session, we, we found some uh, talent in the in this uh, area. And also, we see that this is a doable activity of a program which uh, the, the risk is a bit low as compared to other, other technology. This is our uh, technologies and production expansion, how we, we grow. Of course, in 2013, we started with uh, a lot of R&D, focusing more on chassis, developing our controller, our own controller. Eh? And then also some programming to find the best uh, programming language and so on. So in 2014, we managed to produce one uh, first prototype, which is sellable. And the first customer came to us was uh, Panasonic Malaysia, operating in Shah Alam. So these are the AGVs uh, in standby. And then also to another Japanese uh, company. And then also we sent to another company in Joho. Uh, uh, okay. Then this variety of products we produce mostly divided into three types of carrying, carrying method. Uh, the first is towing which is uh, the loads at the back and just uh, the the toes uh, from one point to another. This is a lifting type. The AGV goes under the trolley and lift it up and move to the destination. And the other type is uh, move underneath the trolley and hook and move forward together with the trolley. In uh, 2020, this year, due to the pandemic, we received uh, urgent request from the uh, uh, hospital to come up with another type of AGV, which is remote control, where we can uh, carry the products or the, the food or the goods to the patient without uh, less interaction between the you know the operators and uh, the patient. And then we came up with another uh, types of uh, AGV. <clears throat> and even uh, currently, we're still in a good demand of this uh, product. Okay. Then uh, this is the uh, some focus of our, of our technologies. So that I can uh, divide our technologies into these uh, few areas. The first is the body and chassis. The challenge with uh, this uh, technology is to have the structure with less weight. We can handle heavy load and, and then to, uh, to withstand uh, a certain amount of, uh, you know, how to make it uh, available in cornering and so on. All right, and then another uh, aspect is in, on the aesthetic aspect. This is very important. Maybe, be, maybe even though it may not directly uh, affecting the operation, but when it goes to the customer, the, this is the first thing that they see. Right. So sometimes we have to also convince them that uh, this uh, AGV can operate to the uh, certain uh, level that they want, even though it may look not like one. Because the challenge is that we still build our body with metal metal sheet so we cannot uh, you know, make it uh, very much attractive as compared to the other companies uh, overseas because they produce with, with a very nice looking uh, body shape maybe because they use a lot of mold um, because they produce in a big mass uh, i mean in a, in a big number so we only produce in the customer customized uh, to the customer needs and mostly use the metals that metal metal component metal parts uh, and also uh, another challenge is that uh, because uh, the we need to adapt with the high customization with the customers because due to the space, due to the load, due to the carrying method, we need to uh, you know adapt to their situation. 
and this is the challenge also to reduce the complexity of the designing and also another uh, challenge is, is to design the attachment because some uh, company or some customers they want it to leave it some they want it to tow and tow so sometimes they need uh, automation and so on so these are also the areas that we also struggling that we cannot uh, adapt or we cannot uh, standardize one for all so this is another challenge one of the challenge with the body and chassis uh, technology uh, another another area is the controller we need to have a flexible with multiple design also as what i mentioned more on the body as well because there are a lot of technologies some uh, we need to do the remote uh, wi-fi uh, uh, attachment of the sensors so we need to have one controller who can handle uh, those kind of uh, requirements and it has to be real robust especially with the current search uh not not to not to damage any kind of uh, components in, uh, inside uh, this is also another issue uh the coding uh maybe i think the professor lecturers very much uh, familiar with this the pid controller for example right because because the agv has to deal with a lot of variations in load and the floor conditions so pid is very very important to ensure the agv goes on the smooth to uh, reduce wobbling with the load uh, effects and so on and also to commonize, just like I mentioned earlier, to have one uh, system that can handle uh, most of the requirements. Another <clears throat> technology that we have is about the navigation. This is very important and very crucial issue as well. Uh, uh, the one I just showed you previously was more on the uh, more on the uh, line following uh, uh, method navigation method, which we lay the magnetic sensors uh, on the floor and the edge will runs along the, the tape, magnetic tape we lay down. But currently customers are requesting for a uh, uh, full automa autonomous uh, navigation system. And currently we already produce uh, this uh, scrubber, which is fully autonomous and has been running in a few places like in hospitals and also in a market in, in, in Ipoh. They are in the process of uh, evaluation and it, it succeeds. It, they, they're interested to purchase more. And also, this is still under design and already succeeded in the autonomous. Uh, this is about this is more on the lifting the uh, trolley uh, in hospitals and also as well as uh, in, the, in the factory without using the uh, magnetic tapes. So, we are still developing this uh, navigation autonomous because. Uh, for the customer, they want a cheap price. So obviously, autonomous is still uh, considered very expensive. So we are looking into ways to try to meet their uh, requirement. The first one is the IoT or communication. IoT, I think, is common words used by uh, common uh, uh, people or experts at this uh, time. But the, the point is about communication. So we managed to produce one, met, uh, one unit, one, uh, what we call it, uh, gadget which can communicate on the level of uh, uh, basket or uh, rubbish in the basket this is also requested by the hospital because uh, they will get fined by the hospital i mean the the service provider in the hospital if they they, they don't uh, empty the trolley on i mean the the the, well, the basket on time so they in encourage or they request us to have a, a, a device who can sense the level of the uh, rubbish in the basket so we successfully uh, implemented this and the only thing is to, to try in the in the field uh, in the real environment another challenge is to find the battery charger this is one of the cherry we call it a uh, uh, wireless type uh, battery charging uh, unit but the price is high highly expensive so one unit is about almost fifteen thousand ringgit Right, but this is very, very useful and uh, very suited to what the customers are requesting at the moment. So, without uh, this, is, if you can implement this, the AGV will uh, uh, reduce to uh, the activity of recharging, reduce the time of uh, charging. And finally, uh, we are looking into the sensors, reliability, uh, price, uh, compatibility, uh, lifespan, and easy configuration. So, basically, these are among the six. Uh, area of technologies that we are working together uh, we are working very hard uh, with the, the suppliers as well as the 
external uh, researchers to provide us with uh, the, the best uh, technologies. So the more major collaboration partners at the moment, we have uh, uh, the fund, sorry, it's not fund, fund uh, this is the funders, uh, Perodua, Mosti, MTDC. After certain uh, time, after the, what we call it, the, the Malaysian, uh, the, the government declare uh, 4.0 uh, program in uh, 2018. So we, had a lot of attention from the government and we started to receive a uh, number of uh, funds to, to continue with our uh, projects. And also, we are collaborating with uh, 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 Konica Malaysia and Medivest. Konica, is, uh, we, we know that is the provider of camera and printing machines, but they are running, off, run, running out of business due to the new development of uh, technology. So they are working to, with us to engage with our technology and uh, do the market, uh, do the market in, uh, locally and uh, uh, overseas. Mendivest is uh, one of the uh, service provider to hospital. Also, we're working with them to penetrate, uh, to go into the hospital services. And for the technologies, uh, I'm, I'm happy to mention that uh, UTEM is one of our collaborators. We are working very uh, closely also with autonomous navigation technology. And also, we receive a lot of facilities uh, to fabricate our machine, uh, our, our products using the machines here, and also uh, to facilitate our testing. So these are among the activities that uh, we are working together with UTM. We have a couple of meetings and uh, strong engagement with some of the lecturers and the professors uh, in UTM. <clears throat> and Mobile is one of the company also in Singapore prov providing with some coding, especially for autonomous. So we rely on these uh, external uh, collaborators to, to, to move forward very fast. And finally, uh, CIRIM is the, the, uh, the certification body who want to certificate our bodies, uh, our products, because some uh, products need to be certified, especially in to go to the hospital before we, we, we can sell. <clears throat> okay, the future uh, opportunities in this company. Uh, of course, uh, Mr. Amizi, uh, yeah. due to time constraint, maybe you can speed up the presentation and proceed with okay. the conclusion or maybe wrap up the presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, as I mentioned a couple of times, we are working with the hospital, cleaning facilities, uh, also some a couple of requests for outdoor automation, uh, agriculture sectors, solar, pe solar panel, cleaner machine, oil and gas, and the higher tonnage of uh, the AGV up to 20 ton. These are among the new requests. And finally, these are the challenges that we're facing. First is to manage the customer expectation. I have put the, you know, the, the, this uh, picture here because some customers, they feel that when we have the AGV, the factory, so the machine can, can do everything. So we need to manage this expectation. Number two is to multi, uh, multiply products, multiple product ranges versus uh, standardization and reliability of the products, look for local talents and keep up with fast moving technologies. So these are among the, the challenges that we're facing and we have to keep up and move fast in the future. All right, so I think that's all for me. Um, I'm, I'm, again, I would like to thank uh, UTEM for the invitation and uh, look forward to uh, continue with the sharing if uh, you have any questions. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you, Mr. Amizi, for the presentation. So, ladies and gentlemen, we are really much appreciating Mr. Amizi Ben Noor for his overwhelming and delightful speech on experiences in technology development, driving innovation from hardware to software environment. So, embracing to new technology requires lots of strategic efforts. So, advance in AGV, we believe that has certainly contributed to this. So, hence, industrial R&D should be performed with great support from university. So participants and the audience, uh, let's move forward to our next uh, industrial speaker. So I'm happy to announce that second industrial research sharing session will be delivered by IR Dr. Abdul Azim Abdul Rahman, Product Engineering Manager, Steelcase Office uh, Solution, Malaysia Syndrome Berhad.
Let me first introduce IR Dr. Abdul Azim. IR Dr. Abdul Azim has graduated his first degree in mechanical engineering, majoring in automotive from University Technology Petronas, then pursue his doctorate PhD under University Putra Malaysia UPM. IR Dr. Azim is a professional engineer registered under Board of Engineer Malaysia, BEM, with over 19 years experience in product research, design and development. Currently, IR Dr. Azim works with Steelcase Office Solution, Malaysia Sindran Berhad, as a product engineering manager, leading the team in Asia Pacific for product development of ergonomic seating, life cycle management, orange box and AMQ. He has experience working around the world and holds six patents from United States of America and Malaysia. He is also very passionate with new product innovation and actively collaborate with local and overseas university. We are very much lucky to have him as today expert to talk about global product de development, design for manufacturing and assembly. Please welcome IR Dr. Abdul Azim Abdul Rahman to deliver for his industrial speech. Assalamualaikum. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Um, and good, still good morning. Good morning to all the participants, professors, uh, my my beloved panels, uh, and Mr. Chairman. So, can you see my screen right now? Ah, uh, yeah. We're still waiting for your slide, Doctor. So, okay. Now it's coming. Okay, great. You may enlarge the size of the slide. Okay, thank you, Doctor. You may proceed. Okay. Yep, 15 minutes to talk about global product development. Probably it's a little crime, but try my best anyway. Um, so, so, Assalamualaikum again. Uh, I think that what I want to share today is about um, global product developments and what is uh, product and design complexity anyway. Sorry, Mr. Chairman, a little bit different from what I give you before. But anyway, this is about global product development. So, let's, so this is the fact. Uh, I just want to share the fact because this is where other companies, other innovators uh, try to see where we're heading. What, what are the, the things going on right now? So if you see people right now, 4 billion people connected, 4 trillion people revenue opportunities in everywhere, in all the products, right? So regardless, any company, any products. Uh, there's a lot, there's 25 million apps right now. So think about it, 25 million apps that have been invented right now, and we're using maybe 50, 60. Uh, 25 billions of the embedded and intelligent system, and 50 trillion gigabytes of data transfer every day. And it's, it's really, as, as the company and as, as the innovator and engineers, um, where we are on this one and where we're heading to. And especially when you're thinking about doing the global product development, how this, all these things Colorate to you and your effort in, in the company. So that that's something to ponder. Anyway, uh, this is a that's a more details on that. What are the data that we are using? Uh, what are the things that um, people connected? So I'm going to skip this one. And again, we talk about the global product development is is the whole world. Uh, and we know that we have a um, um, different continents, and for mainly for the business. Um, at least for our company, uh, we separate the global between North America and the America, EMEA. EMEA stands for Europe, Middle East, and Africa, and Asia Pacific region, where it covered from uh, India until New Zealand and Australia. And why, why we divide by that, especially in business, especially in Europe? Why EMEA, Middle East, and Africa? Because of Middle East and Africa, they adopt mostly the European standard. That's the reason that when we design the product for them, they have to comply to you mostly European standard. Uh, that's the reason the business been split that way in, in, in high level. Um, this is the Asia Pacific, just to show where we are in Asia Pacific, our company, uh, where's our team located in India, China, and Malaysia. Okay, that's a little bit introduction. 
Um, what I want to talk today, I will try to go through facts. Um, so there's a lot of things I want to share, but uh, this is the main key. I want to share about what is the product development process that we are doing in the company and how we make it really uh, effective because thinking about one design to suit global, especially in economic, especially in electric term, it's not something that easy. Uh, but we managed to do that. Uh, we have a global product uh, been using for our biggest, one of our biggest client, Google, Microsoft. They have all this, um, our product in their office and, and they are split around the world also. For example, Google, they want office in US, in, uh, in India, in, in China, and even in Europe, all look the same. In UK, all look the same. And all the system, same system. And second, I want to try to touch a little bit about the research that we are doing. Um, actually, some this research we are doing really from the company and collaborate to some of the universities and really focus on the material uh, process where we're having a problem in industry. And I'm pretty sure it's a common problem for all industries. And the last thing, I just want to give a sneak peek what we are doing uh, to uh, respond uh, uh, in COVID. Uh, there's a lot of opportunity out there anyway for the universities, for all the researchers. Is it moving? Okay, yep, I, I skip this one. So th there's, a, there's a really a five reason actually. If you talk about global product development, there are really a five reason why we do global product development. And of course, uh, one of it is because of lower cost. We try to optimize everywhere in the world the resources so that we get the optimum or optimized cost. And, of, and we improve the process also because of in US and in China, there's a different approach of manufacturing anyway. Uh, there's a lot of different process and there is no better than the other, to be honest. Every, everybody has their own advantage and we leverage the advantage so that we get a really a good optimum uh, product. And of course, it's a global growth is very important. When, when we have global present, we have a global growth in the revenue. Um, and as I mentioned, optimize the sources, engineers and materials, and of course, technology access. We have, um, we, we should know where the technology been uh, invented and developed. For example, in India, it's really strong in the uh, programming. In China, it's really strong in the uh, detail manufacturing, like tools, uh, even the even the, the mass production. So, so we identify that and we use that as our supply chain uh, for the betterment of the product. So, this is the five level. I will not too quick. I'm, I'm pretty sure that a lot of us learn about this one in high level. But this is what we our company split it, and it's really effective. Uh, there's a phase we div uh, divide by five phases in the product. So if you think about the product itself, there are five phases in the product life lifetime. It's a phase one A where we started to have an idea and exploring what we call it a marketing brief. This is really important. I know that a lot of people have a lot of ideas, but they skip this step, which is a marketing brief. Where the product should be going to? What is the customer? What is the target group? And how is the market looks like, the competitive review. And 1B is more on, once we know so well about the 1A, we go with 1B where all them started to have a design, engineering, concept, feasibility on that. In phase two is mainly about the development where we start to kick up the tooling. We start to uh, verify all the tooling and make sure that all fully comply to the standard, everything. In phase three is more implementation into the production trial, line, line setup. And four is a life cycle. So this is another thing that always people are missing. Phase four is a life cycle management. And, and some product, it, it varies depending on the product. Some product is really like a two years or six month life cycle. But for us, like our, our industry, the office furniture and office solution, some of, uh, most of the product is more than 10 years life cycle. Uh, because it's ergonomy. It's not like in, in six months. It, it takes three, five years to understand the ergonomics and to stand some product 20 years. So there's a lot of activities in this space also. So anyway, uh, this is a summarize. Uh, and we, we learned a lot about, about the sequential engineering. What is it? We learned a lot about the concurrent engineering, which is a lot of companies using the concurrent engineering. But what we came up with uh, on top of that, uh, I, I'm not going to go details because it's so long discussion, but what we come up with is that concurrent engineering plus partnership. So we have the really developed almost 10 years to partner from suppliers, from even our own team, even our OEM. So that on top of 
all the concurrent engineering plus partnership, we save 20% of the conventional or even the current concurrent engineering product development. This is proof with all our product, even the global product, when we develop comparing some of our competitor or even, even our, our previous product, we save 20% not only from the timeline, but from the, uh, from, the, uh, from the cost, from the engineering effort, and even better features. So there's a long uh, things to get to this one anyway. Yep, it built up from the trust, same goal, and also capability and competency. So we have to understand what's capability and competency for each of the partners. Anyway, I want to jump to the first uh, division, uh, first um, uh, research. Um, it's, it's about product anyway. If you see the product that we had, this is some of it. Most of the product, if you take a look 10 years or 20 years ago, or even 30 years ago, is started with steel. Steel is, is a main. But now most of the product, when we want to get a weight over ratio, lighter, uh, better shape, better performance, better flexibility, we move to the plastic. And to make the plastic work as a structure, it's not easy anyway. So we be one of the first company in the world make the plastic engineering formulation together with our partner for this kind of uh, structure chair. Uh, you can take a look at the, the history uh, from the website anyway, but this is really interesting transition from metal to plastic. Um, and this is some of the uh, building office that we have to comply anyway, just to show you guys how to comply even the electrical Mobility is all difficult from country to country. But I want to go with this one. How, how we distribute uh, the design globally. And if you can see that uh, this design in the US and Europe, but other engineering spread around the world, assembly spread around the world, uh, is something that we have to take a look really close, uh, depending on the five pillars that I talked about previously. It's like, uh, but what Share because of uh, we have a really limited time. Let me share. So, so again, just the chair itself. There's a lot of chairs. So you have to identify, and different chairs have different function anyway. And from this one, there's a lot of regulation. Right? So you have to understand a lot of regulation. How to comply with all these regulation globally? That's something that we have to consider everything if we claimed it as a global product. And that's an example how we um, combine every single uh, requirement around the world for economy, electrical material to make it one product. This is all the standard. This is how we come up with the concept to make it functional. Um, this is how, and this is a one I want to share. It's quite interesting. Uh, if you, if nothing different with anything, even the any product, when you want to do the verification of the product. You need a device, and that device could be different between country to country. That's a problem when um, you have a, one product in Malaysia, you try to sell in the US, and they said, oh, this is, this is not the same requirement. Because some of the equipment that they do to testing or measure the device, uh, the product is different. And our company, lucky, because we are, we are driven globally uh, with uh, a lot of us, um, authority, including ISO. So as simple as the chair device measurement, if you, to, if you want to design a chair, you have to know this device. Because otherwise, you cannot claim that this chair is ergonomy or height of the chair or angle of the chair recline. So this is called CMD, chair measurement device. So five years ago, or, uh, um, in normal situation, we have a device made in US where US uh, body authority, they call it BIFMA, business of furniture, using that, this one. And in Europe, we have a one device. And in German, they specific have their own device, CUV. It, it's, it's so different when we measure. And it's so difficult for us to develop. And in fact, there's a lot of uh, discussion. And what we really push out and propose globally, and it's already been accepted by ISO, is this one. It, there is a, just a introduced last year, we call it a universal chair devices under ISO, where uh, our company is a one big, Player to come up with this one. So this is one example how how difficult to make it a global product and how to make sure that it's aligned to get into the specification like TUV, European Standard, uh, United States, and even in China and Australia, they have their own device right now. So this is one of the research that we really done with uh, some of the university, even in MIT also, just to get the accurate measurements. 
And if you imagine about the buildings, like we have a flammability codes different, this is another challenge. And how we solve this one is in a big area of research. Uh, and I don't think we have enough time to, to, to explain all this here, but there is a, a few solutions how to get this one right anyway. All right, uh, so this is the one I want to go a little bit detail. I don't know how much time I have now. Um, in, in, in developing a product, especially the component itself, as I mentioned, the plastic. So nylon, nylon is a big part of the plastic that really formulate uh, a best uh, for the structure right now. And, and uh, adding to the engineering formulation with the glass field, with the fiber, make it really feasible to become any strong structure. And in fact, we designed one chair, and uh, you can Google SIP chair, S-I-L-Q, without any mechanism matter, it's all plastic, and it's a form special polymer that we formulate that can act as a spring, and everything is a plastic, it's in one chair, and it's a touch chair. So what is important when, when, we, we, when we deal with this plastic, we did a lot of research anyway, and I, I'm pretty sure a lot of you understand nylon is a special, but it's really special also where it absorbs moisture really fast. And that really impacts the performance. And by theory, uh, nylon in the dry condition uh, into the stabilized condition at the end of the lifetime, it has a different about 40% of the performance, especially in terms of strength. I think that is a theory. That's, that's a... That's from the books and from the literature. But what we know on that is not enough actually to make sure that our product is really viable, especially when we design the product, um, to make it uh, 12 years. So our warranty is lifetime, 12 years, 15 years of the chair. How, how we can come from that? At the same time, we cannot just over design in the industry. We need to make sure that we optimize. We, we do cost per product. So the challenge of this one is uh, we design, uh, we have only on the theory 40%. We have to over design to make it 40% uh, cover the strength. Uh, because we, we, we don't have, there's no enough literature in between where or in the west, what, what situation nylon can absorb and the best for uh, prediction. Because if we get the parts from injection, when we do a testing right away, we get a good result, but it does not represent the final condition. In fact, if we not testing in the three days, the result will be different because of the moisture absorption difference. So what, how we deal with this one? What, what we develop, we do a research, this is a special machine, we call it a post-condition nylon. And this is um, what uh, I'm doing the research with my company and in fact a part of my also, we develop a machine to, for post condition where when we after we inject the nylon components, we can go through this machine, and depending on the weight, depending on the volume of the parts, depending on how much moisture that we need it absorb, so that we can replicate the final condition of the product, it can be setting. And in fact, it's a, a automatic setting now for the weight because the weight is really impact the moisture absorption and also the space surface of the volume. So, yeah, uh, I Azim, uh, really for time management, uh, maybe you can proceed with the conclusion uh, because we have about two minutes yep. left. Yeah, it's almost. Okay, thank you. Yep, I, I almost uh, to the conclusion anyway. So anyway, so this is the, 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 the one that we did where we can really rely on the result because it's so difficult when we have parts to test, but we never know whether it impacts by the different environment so that's uh, the mission does and this is some of the some of the data that we compare and the last one uh, one, one minute i want to just summarize so this is the what we did but sure no problem share this one but I want to high level. yeah i want to get a high level what's coming and what what can be taught uh, can be think uh, in in all the researcher so what's next um this is not about covid only it's about every every day and we we study this one really really uh, in future this environment for office, back to office. So people talking about how to be back to office. Uh, all the CEOs say that they want people back to office anyway. We have a round table with all the leaders around the world. What we do is that there's a three things, office layout, material, and equipment. So for the office layout, I think that it's really about out of the box. 
everything is about other bugs. It's really sketch, man. We have other solution. It's still confidential anyway. But this is a high level. What's coming? What, what should we think about right, in, in office? And also, for the material itself, I'm doing a lot of the study in details on the formulation with a few partners in the plastic and also um, a different OEM about uh, copper infused uh, to fabric, copper infused and silver infused to the material like nylon, which is very difficult because silver is always fight against the glass pin. It will re reduce the strength. Uh, but we, we found a way how to make it. It's really, really nice. And it will come anyway. And the last thing is the human device. So we have all the uh, auto sensor uh, about uh, uh, study on the UV, how that can be embedded into the product, or how can it be embedded to the office. There's, there's a lot of things we can think about. Um, and there will be a lot of opportunity to close the gap between the uh, university and the industry. Uh, and anytime, I think that it's a good thing to have that anyway. I started with a lot of university, and one of it is a UPM right now. We study some of the material. With that, thank you. Thank you, IR Dr. Abdul Azim Abdul Rahman for his very remarkable and engaging industrial sharing on global product design and innovation focusing on design complexity. This is a very important issue to all of us considering on current miniaturization challenge for product development in manufacturing industry and focusing on post-COVID-19 era. Remember, ladies and gentlemen, all the five phases involved in exploration and product roadmap. Ladies and gentlemen, now our third industrial speaker is ready for his turn. We move to the next industrial speaker, Mr. Abdul Karim bin Muhammad Nasir, Director Sanan Utama Sendirian Berhad. Let me first introduce Mr. Abdul Karim. Mr. Abdul Karim has started his education with Diploma in Banking from the University of Technology Mara UITM before pursuing his first degree in Bachelor Business Administration at Sam Houston State University. University, Texas, United States of America. He later pursued his master's at the same university in an agricultural field. Mr. Abdul Karim is a founder of Sinan Utama Sendirian Berhad located in Malacca. This company is manufacturing gold milk soap. His knowledge in business and manufacturing processes has finally led him to his current position as director of Sinan Utama Sendirian Berhad. Just as a highlight in 2017, Mr. Abdul Karim has actively participated in a mostly collaborative project with the Malaysian Cocoa Board that the project was about 1.875 million ringgit Malaysia to innovate saponification of cocoa butter soap. In 2019, Mr. Abdul Karim has collaborated with University Technical Malaysia Melaka UTAM for the innovation of an automated vacuum grind dryer for manufacturing of seaweed powder. I believe the project is still ongoing. We feel very grateful to have Mr. Abdul Karim as an expert in industrial entrepreneurship and research-based manufacturing to be with us today. Without further ado, please welcome Mr. Abdul Karim, I pass this virtual mic to you. Thank you. Yes, yeah, Mr. Yeah, Mr. Yeah, Assalamualaikum. Assalamualaikum. Now. Waalaikumsalam, uh, Mr. Abdul Karim. You may proceed. Yes, yeah, Assalamualaikum to all the panels. Yeah, uh, my line is not very clear over here, uh, but I will, I will keep on. Yeah. Yeah, Assalamualaikum. Okay, this, uh, we are just a small, medium scale industry, uh, own family business. And they, we started about 30... Uh, Mr. Abdul Karim, sorry uh, for interruption. Maybe you can enlarge the slide into slideshow yeah. setting. Thank you. It's not very really clear. The line is not very really clear.
Sorry, sorry, the line is not clear here. Can't hear you well. But it's okay, yeah, you may proceed. You well, uh, we uh, still uh, can hear you, I, Mr. I can Abdul Karim. Without hearing you. Uh, yeah. So, uh, as I said, uh, we are a small business enterprise. Uh, we started on our own, it's a family business. Uh, we started about 35 years ago. And uh, this is presented in the, in the profile. Excuse me, sorry. We are adjusting the, the voice now. Yeah, uh, please take your time because we are also requesting you to enlarge the uh, screen uh, yes, for the slideshow setting. All right, now we can see the. Yeah, that's all breaking sound. Okay. All right, great. You can proceed now, uh, Mr. Abdul Karim. Your voice also okay, very clear. Yeah, I can start introducing the company. Because in 1988, uh, we start the we start very small, our own, our family business uh, with the second hand equipment to produce uh, soap scraps. Uh, then we 89, we start to produce uh, hotel soap. Yes. Are you clear to hear me? Yes, uh, we can hear you clearly. Okay, All right. then uh, we do... Uh, in 97, we... we oh, hold on, some, uh, hold on. Sorry, the line is not clear. Uh, so... The, the production of uh, first goat's milk soap uh, is in '97, where we we break the, the market of uh, the first uh, goat's milk soap produced in Malaysia. Uh, that by then we we managed to get a Mara loan where we fully paid, and we have a small farm of 150 uh, goats where we extract the uh, milk to produce soap. And in 98 and 2014, we produced various value added soap under the name uh, the Senin brand. Uh, yeah, this production are fully automated now. Um, some of the machine we got it from India, some are from China, which is uh, whatever is suitable to our needs. This is the half time in our production line. The, uh, Soap of uh, herbals and the, uh, the soap of the herbal and the cosmetic types are, are not are not as the same as a normal a normal soap. It, need, it needs to be uh, adjusted according uh, the machine needs to be adjusted according to the requirement of, of the soap, the texture of the soap. Uh, this is the packet packaging machine. This one we we bought it from from China. And this uh, been two years now. We're running this machine. Uh, it's easily uh, uh, operated, and we can have we can repair it outside if there's any problem. So these are the, the tools and labor. We call it this machine, this packaging machine. Okay. Yeah. This. Uh, and these are the type of soap that we have in, the, uh, in our production now and also in the market. Uh, we normally uh, use uh, local fruits, local herbs to produce our our product. So, uh, that means a, I'm, I'm more of agriculture based. Uh, then the, uh, we use gamat. Gamat is uh, from Langkawi, as usual, or in from, from uh, Semporna. And the oats and rice bran is, is locally uh, uh, produced from, uh, we get it from the rice field and or even oats we can get from the supermarket. And uh, our latest product is the use of cocoa butter where we have uh, technology uh, collaboration with uh, Malaysian Cocoa Board. Uh, so uh, these are the types of soap that we have here. Uh, we're also uh, producing now cocoa butter with seaweed collagen 
where the seaweed will be uh, collaborated uh, collaborated with the uh, UTEM. We're doing a drying of seaweed uh, to be to be mixed with the cocoa butter. Then the next, uh, these are the the exhibition that we went to Bosnia to to Serdan, in China and a few other places. And we send our soup to hotels to uh, Tesco, Maiden. Uh, this are where our market is. And next will be uh, what we do now. Uh, we managed to get a uh, do collaboration with Lem uh, Lebaga Coco, which is a Malaysian cocoa board, and they, they come up with the technology of sulfonication. Sulfonication is a process after transforming uh, oil into soap. But, uh, it's called saponication means sapona. Sapona is in, in Latin, which is uh, sabon, soap. So saponication is a process of uh, turning oil into soap. Uh, it is not uh, the same as what is in, is done in by by normal process. The normal process of uh, saponication is uh, a very big process, and they use a lot of uh, steam, a lot of uh, tanks. But the technology from a Malaysian cocoa board is very simple very cheap and we have a reactor the reactor we pump in the ethanol and we pump in the cocoa base cocoa butter sludge they call it cbdd cocoa butter distillate these are the not uh, very useful product uh, as they throw it away it's very dark and smell dark in color and very smelly but with the technology we can turn it into white color and uh, the odor is uh, no odor. It's a very, very good smell. And from there on, uh, we produce into powder, powder uh, soap base. Uh, powder soap base is good for mixing, as it can disperse off a lot of other ingredients, like, uh, for example, like uh, perfume, or you put any other fillers. It is easy to mix when it's in powder form. Uh, we, intend, we also intend to sell our soap base uh, because soap base that we produce, uh, we also uh, mix with the uh, coconut oil. Uh, coconut oil, we, uh, we, we extract ourselves the coconut oil. We bring, we bring it from Indonesia and we extract the coconut oil ourselves because we want to know that it's pure. And normally we use about 20% coconut oil, 30% or 10% coconut oil. 10% uh, co coconut oil, which is e equivalent to... Uh, this uh, palm, palm kernel. Palm kernel and coconut oil is of the same uh, quality, but better better is to use a coconut oil. Because using coconut oil, it is easier to export to Europe and, and America. But using palm oil, we have a lot of problem uh, to enter the market. Uh, coconut oil uh, for use for export, we normally use about 30% uh, to be exported to cold country because the coconut oil will soften the soap while uh, the cocoa base is to harden the soap. So it's 80-20 for local market here, which is uh, in temperate can, uh, hot country, a tropical country, we use 80-20. For export, we use 30-70 uh, of the soap base. Uh, then uh, we come up with the cocoa butter, where we also mix with uh, seaweed, where we have the collaboration with uh, UTAM to produce the dry seaweeds. Now I'm, I'm using the wet seaweed now as we we boil the seaweed and it turns into paste and we put in the soap. And our our product has been recognized in parliament uh, so much so that we are given the opportunity to have another research with uh, National Cocoa Board to produce a medical stick with shea butter. We use cocoa butter too. So... Uh, these are the research with uh, with them. We do research now with, with them. Uh, we produce uh, uh, first. Now we have this research to produce uh, uh, low feeder. That mean we used to carry this uh, soap base into the mixer. Now the feeder we have a suction feeder there that we we suck the soap base into the mixer. So yeah, these are the, the one have been we have already completed this project with UTEM. And then the you see that it is running.
we are this um, now if we are the figure the data both figure the we use have one people to uh, to place the hotel soap inside the uh, fluoride machine uh, now we don't have to have anybody to place it as we put uh, the all the the cut or the stem uh, hotel soap into the feeder and it goes straight into our uh, fluoride uh, machine This is a project in Vietnam. We have uh, completed it uh, within the time within the time frame. Uh, Tuan Haji Karim, maybe you can uh, wrap up the presentation uh, so that we can uh, follow the schedule. Thank you. Okay. All right, so uh, this is our next project. Yeah, yeah. Okay. all right. So, okay. okay. All right, so this shall be automated seaweed powder processing. Uh, this is our ongoing project with UTEM. Uh, we are about 20% uh, done now, the project. Uh, so we are uh, uh, anticipated to complete by middle of next year. Okay, these are all the certification that we get. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Abdul Karim Muhammad Nasir, for his wonderful sharing on active university industry research collaboration yeah. and oh, priceless you. experience on halal based the, product the, manufacturing, the was not focusing on soap cannot, industry. Get the, uh, proper, uh, here. All right. So, ladies and gentlemen, uh, now we take this opportunity to open for question and answer in this panelist session to our industrial speakers, Mr. Amizi bin Mohammed bin Nur, IR Dr. Abdul Azim Abdul Rahman, and Mr. Abdul Karim bin Mohammed Nasir. Please welcome. Participant, ladies and gentlemen, it is your opportunity to give question to the speaker. Please drop it at the Q&A chat box and don't forget to note to, to whom the question is addressed to. We will assist you by reading the question on behalf. Thank you. So maybe we can start with the first round of question and answer. So maybe I can start with IR uh, Abdul Azim uh, as posted in the chat box. So we need to uh, give the question on air so that we can broadcast uh, your opinion. So again, uh, IR Abdul Azim, how do you compromise between the needs to optimize uh, the development cost versus the need to comply with high performance and product quality. Please welcome. Sure, thank, thank you. Yeah, this is a very good question and it's not easy to be honest. That's the reason that you see most of the successful companies they have a lot of range of the products. This is not easy. And what we need to do is balance uh, what, what we need and we define our product range, right? Because there's a, a lot of different country has a different requirement. I'll give you an example. Um, when I started to design for India, it's very unique. I, I read through a lot of these um, articles from MIT about how, how the car company goes to India. And one of it is very interesting. That's a share a little bit. So uh, they try to reduce the cost in India because the power of buying is very low compared to US. Most of the car company, they come to India, they want to reduce the cost. They, they reduce the back seat power window and they use a crank one because they said, oh, that's the cheapest value option. Uh, but in India, it's different because most of in the mid-range level, they have a driver. So driver has a power window, but the, the, the boss has no power window. So it's kind of opposite thinking. So, so what I'm trying to say is that we have to understand that uh, what we need to sell this product, what we need to do Two things. First is we need to make sure we understand where the country we're selling this one, and we need to 
The second is we have to leverage the global technology in the world. All right. Uh, Sorry, thank you, uh, IR Ab uh, Abdul Azim, uh, for this uh, insight. And then uh, maybe we can move uh, forward to the next question in this first round uh, to Mr. Amizi. Mr. Amizi, from your experience, what are the most tricky challenges in technology development for any collaborative research project involving industry and university? And from your personal view, how could we systematically resolve all those issues for win-win situation? Please welcome uh, Mr. Amizi. Thank you for the question. And also, this is a very, very extremely good question and practical because always. So, uh, note to Mr. Abdul Karim, maybe you can mute the mic. Okay. All right. Uh, okay, Mr. Amizi, you can uh, continue yeah. to answer the question. Okay. N number one, we, we have initiated a lot, a lot of uh, efforts to work together with local universities from the day one. Uh, uh, as if you can remember, we started in 2013, right? From then on, also, we started to get the support and work together with some local universities. But again, uh, I think uh, we can understand the nature of works from the professors, lecturers. They also engage in a lot of activities on the teaching and so on. Uh, I would like to say that friend, uh, my previous experience was not very good <laughs> working with the universities because this is uh, quite uh, very deep uh, inside technology. It has to do a lot of uh, you know uh, research, trying and errors and so on. But recently, I found out there are some uh, good initiative. Then also, we as uh, manufacturer also, I think are so called smart enough. To, to gauge which part of the technology that we can share, uh, we can expect from the universities, and which one that we have to do on our own. Or maybe something, something we can uh, source it outside and look for the you know, uh, professional to do that. Uh, for example, as I mentioned earlier, we work with uh, UTEM and also some uh, uh, activities going on working with UTM. Okay, the, 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 because uh, now we, I, I can see that uh, the, the person or the universities who came to us, they are really enthusiastic in uh, working together. Because before that, we go and approach the university. So uh, I hope that uh, this kind of uh, you know, openness will bring uh, together. Because uh, for your information, we, we, we as a company also, we have uh, allocated already to share our technology or our business sharing with the technology from universities who are willing to participate and really can uh, you know, facilitate the uh, research. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you, Mr. Amizi. Uh, I think uh, that's a great opinion uh, from the industrial expert on the uh, collaboration research project between the university and industry. So maybe we can uh, proceed to our third industrial speaker, Mr. Abdul Karim. So Mr. Abdul Karim, first and foremost, please share your precious tip on how to gain mutual trust with industry counterpart for successful university industry research collaboration. So please, uh, Mr. Abdul Karim. So uh, we uh, we got uh, some uh, technical uh, hiccup here. So maybe we can uh, proceed to the second rounds of the question and answer. We get back to IR Azim. So IR Azim, uh, this is a special question. I think current question related with COVID-19. How is the current global COVID-19 outbreak has changed the direction of global product development and innovation and how we can adapt with this holistically. So please comment on this. Thank you. Okay, that's a big question anyway. Uh, we had that discussion almost several months already 
And uh, one of the big impact of the uh, COVID, uh, the main thing is the cost of the freight. Um, if you read through, most of the freight through the uh, sea right now is stuck in the West Port in California. And that cost almost 150% of the increment of the cost for the freight itself. So that's really impact the, uh, the product run to one country to another. So that, that's the thing. I think that back to the question, what is the impact on the global product development? I think global product development is the solution. And the reason is we have to have, the company have to plan properly. That's why there's a business in North America, Europe, and Asia. So every continent have their own factory for that particular market. But of course, the design itself has to be global in order to get it fit. We have to leverage more workers, material, commodity. And when we develop, so the good things our company already think about this one. And when we develop something in China, in China market, we use everything local commodity with the performance of global. That's something that we have to think through, especially this COVID anyway also. Uh, more locals, more uh, leverage on the locals uh, expertise anyway. That's what we do right now. All right. Uh, thank you, IR Abdul Azim. So uh, we proceed with uh, our sec our first industrial speaker, Mr. Amizi. Mr. Amizi, so we are very much interested uh, interested to seek your personal opinion on our country, Malaysia, uh, about uh, the readiness in technology development for global product innovation uh, for IR 4.0 and 5G era. Please uh, welcome, Mr. Amizi. Okay, thank you. Uh, what I can see from the the progress at the moment is that number one, the government is getting more active in terms of, in terms of engaging or uh, leading towards the proper guidelines to what the companies who are interested in uh, you know, uh, to engage in the technologies. For example, I visited a couple of times to Korea. They have one uh, uh, agent from the government who coordinate the industries and channel the the, the, the the funds from the government effectively. So we don't have that kind of uh, arrangement in Malaysia yet, from my observation. So, but currently there are a lot of efforts also from various uh, agency governments to, to, to go towards this and uh, we, we can see the changes is happening. And for example, our company uh, was appointed to be uh, a leader in one of the, uh, to coordinate several small companies. Now we are serving uh, the technology in the Pasar Ipoh. So we have a few robots uh, serving that. I think you can see this uh, from on the news, latest news as well. So this is a kind of collaboration of several companies and the government is going to channel the funds and the facilities to uh, us together, number one. Number two, we can see that the, the issues of foreign workers, uh, the issue of increasing of the operating costs. So a lot of companies also are trying to uh, adopt into technologies and this is quite a big, a big uh, opportunities for us as well. And number three, the, this technology actually uh, supposed to be available in our country, but the cost to, to, to import from outside is very expensive, number one. Number two is because of the after sales service. So because of this, among the uh, customers that I mentioned earlier in my presentation, they still uh, chose to purchase from us just because of the local, local support. And in fact, some of the AGVs that we produce, we produce uh, to them, simply we refurbish from their old AGVs. So I would say that the technology or the, what we call it, uh, the opportunities is growing very, very big, especially for, for the students who want to engage in this kinds of uh, environment is going to be a very, very big area for uh, to grow forward. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Nur, uh, Amizi bin Nur, uh, for your kind opinion. Uh, related with the given question. So we actually behind the time. So maybe in a quick view, a question to our uh, panel one and panel two, uh, Mr. Azimi, uh, Mr. Amizi bin Noor and uh, IR Abdul Azim. 
Uh, in a quick view, question to our industrial speaker in this panelist session. For five to ten years from now, how do you foresee or maybe predict the university and industry involvement in mutually benefited academic industry research? And why do we need to have such collaboration? So maybe we can start with IR Abdul Azim first. Please welcome. <coughs> So I think that, to me, we should bridge the gap. I think there's a lot of effort right now. If we're looking at if we continue the effort continuously, and I, uh, we are one of it, if I try to uh, really bridge the gap, especially in the US, and I hope in Malaysia we get more and more. In five to 10 years, it's supposed to be hand-to-hand. -hand. So, so as I mentioned that's not like, that's now, we need to leverage the local. We need to leverage what we have. So in industry and uh, economy, People think on right now, we are thinking it's so much different. But to me, it's the same thing in one line. It, it, it pursues the right, right direction in the technology. So if, if we can work hand to hand, for example, from the in, um, in university, we work together with industry in terms of the sharing the technical knowledge and also um, because the, the, the knowledge is not only coming one side, coming from not just reading, but coming from the observation and experience also. That experience can come back to university. University can come back to the book to the industry. I'm pretty sure in five to ten years, if Malaysia can do that, I, I don't see that Malaysia cannot be same level with Korea or US or even China right now. If, if you know that in Korea, all the R and D in Korea, especially Samsung, more or more than eighty percent is a doctorate. So and they they they're doing the really a study to get to their own university. This is something that we need to move forward. We need to bridge the gap. We should not have the uh, uh, egoistic between industry or uh, university. Gap have to, barrier have to crush, work together in open way. That's my that's my hope and my thinking. There's a lot of opportunity to be honest. Thank you, uh, I R Abdul Azim. And how about you, Mr. Amizi bin Nur? Please proceed. Mr. No, Amizi, can you please unmute the mic? Unmute. All right, thank you. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> All right, okay. First, we cannot deny the the needs for to uh, to, to to get uh, knowledge in the future because the, the the technology is going to grow very very fast, and everyone has to get engaged or get to adapted uh, very much in the technology. Number two, in terms of engagement with industries and 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 and, and the industry and the universities. Both sides has to be open up and work together very well because now we can see that uh, one aspect that they can comment that some students or most I would say majority of the students who go into industry they cannot you know uh, adapt with the environment so maybe the syllabus or the university approaches of uh, you know giving the knowledge has to be uh, modified or changed in future demand of the technology as well. So the, or else you may have a big gap and we have, have a, you know, industry especially will be frustrating, continues to, to have the uses of the students uh, like this. Uh, uh, yeah, for example, some of students who come to us also doesn't uh, understand the very basic things in the manufacturing, like uh, you know, Japanese uh, terms of manufacturing, uh, Kaizen, Lean manufacturing, and just, just things, right? So this is one of the examples. But what I'm trying to say that another area of uh, industries are looking forward is about the technology. I can see that a lot of universities of uh, learning, higher learning institution, really uh, enthusiasts enthusiast toward uh, providing engineers, providing the uh, design people. Uh, but I think we need a lot of people also on the technology, on the technical sides, uh, who can proceed and continue to enhance our uh, uh, technology in the future. Number two. Number three, just in last comment to what uh, Dr. Abrahman mentioned just now, I can see a lot of uh, effort or uh, trend now from the uh, uh, Korea or German. Those who started a new companies, they are uh, PhD holders. They started from their universities, they work together with the professors, and uh, eventually they uh, go out from the uh, study, 
and uh, come up with a new technology with their own company. I think that's all. Thank you very much. All right. Uh, thank you uh, to all of our industrial uh, speakers. Uh, it's all about the narrowing the gap uh, on human resource. So watch out to all of our graduates. Let's prepare for the future needs of industry. So um, ladies and gentlemen, so it seems like real industrial sharings are really, really much interesting to all of us. So I think uh, we should uh, stop here. And on behalf of the IRIT 2020 Organizing Committee, we would like to thank all distinguished industrial speaker, Mr. Amizi bin Noor, IR Dr. Abdul Azim Abdul Rahman, and Mr. Abdul Karim bin Muhammad Noor for the valuable industrial sharing session and panelist discussion. Also not forgotten the Organizing Committee, uh, would like to thank all the participants, invited guests, committee members and all of you in the audience for being very, very supportive and energetic towards the success of this academic event. Thank you, thank you and thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, some important announcement. Event will be adjourned for lunch.